My mic was not ready. Amen. Amen. Has God been good to you this morning, Christ the way? If God's been good to you, let me hear you say amen. Amen. If God's been good to you, let me hear you say praise the Lord. If God brought you through some stuff this week, let me hear you stand to your feet. Give God a glory. Hallelujah. Come on, let's stand up in this place this morning. If God's been good to you, if God's been blessing you, if God has brought you through some stuff, let's say glory, hallelujah, this morning to God. God is good all the time. We serve a big, mighty, wonderful, powerful God this morning. I'm very excited to be here in church this morning at Christ the Way because God is doing wonderful things in this church. And you're just seeing the beginning of it. God is about to bless you more than you have room enough to receive it. Praise the Lord, somebody in this place. God is good. Though we are few, though we come from different backgrounds and nations and kindreds and tongues and people, we serve a God who is one. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Lord. Glory to God. This morning, I'm happy to be here and happy to be Jamaican. Keep standing. We're going to read the scripture reading this morning. It was read in Spanish, and I don't speak Spanish. You see? You see? I didn't even know what language that was, but it was beautiful, beautifully read. And so this morning, I'm going to read it in English. I won't even go into the Jamaican dialect. And so I'm following the tradition of Pastor Natufe to stand in respect as we read the Word of God. The Word of God says, if you have your Bible, you can go to John chapter 17. Yes, and we're going to read just verses 21, uh, 20 and 21, and I'll do that in the New International Version. And it says here, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe me through their message. I pray that they will be one. I pray that they will be one, just as you and I, Father, are one as you are in me and I am in you. I want you to turn to your neighbor and with all the ebullience that you can muster, say, we are one. Let us turn to your neighbor and say, we are one. Turn to the next side and say, the Lord is praying for his church. That they may be one. Father, we thank you for your word. It is powerful. It is quick. It has life and it speaks. And we pray this morning that your word will echo in the four corners of this building in Jesus' name. You may be seated. I'm excited if you, if you didn't notice. I'm very excited this morning because it's a beautiful day in church. It's a wonderful day to praise God in the sanctuary. Now, I was told I only have 10 to 15 minutes, but probably 10, so I won't keep you long, I promise. But I will allow the Spirit to lead. President Donald J. Trump. Oh, (laughs) hope I didn't ruffle any feathers. Ouch. President Donald J. Trump is arguably one of the most influential person in our world today. As a matter of fact, despite losing the 2020 presidential election, Donald Trump received over 74 million votes. The most ever for any sitting president in the history of the United States. Most of you may know, but if you didn't know, here's a news flash. Mr. Trump has been in the media lately because his campaign was alleged to pay $100,000 to a famous porn star to keep quiet during the 2020 presidential election. And if you were following, you would have known that he was convicted on all 34 counts. And interestingly enough, within 24 hours of the verdict, Trump's campaign raised approximately $53 million. 
Within moments of being convicted as a felon, the first in the history, the first president in the history of the United States to be a convicted felon, within 24 hours of the verdict, his campaign raised $53 million. The surge continued, and over the next three days, the, the amount raised was about $200 million for his campaign. $200 million U.S. dollars. His message, his ethos, his alma mater, make America great again. And at the epicenter of his message is the word unity. It's the word unity. And whether you agree or disagree with his perspective, from his perspective, the foundation of his message is we are one. But this is not unique to President Donald Trump. We are not short of leaders who have tried to influence the world. This is not unique to him. When you look back at leaders who have tried to influence the world, you go back to antiquity and you look at people like Julius Caesar. When you look at Julius Caesar, Julius was one of the greatest emperors in the history of the Roman Empire. As a matter of fact, he was so great that his name lived through the entirety of the Roman Empire. From his ascension to power to the fall of the empire in 476 AD. And this was mainly in part too because of his, of, of, of his, of, of his, his nephew, Emperor Augustus Caesar, his name, Julius Caesar, became a title for a lineage of emperors known as the Caesars. And this was accomplished mainly in part by his nephew, Augustus Caesar, who was filled with indignant and, 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 and anger when 27 senators, forgiven by Julius Caesar for treason, butchered him on the Senate steps, stabbed 27 times by men he loved, and left to die from the wound of his betrayal. His message, his ethos, his alma mater, we are one. He wanted to make Rome great again. When you think of people who influence Christianity, we think of the Apostle Paul. We think of the Apostle Paul as a bastion of truth, a fierce defender of the gospel. He was revered in Christendom as the most influential evangelist of all time. The Apostle Paul was revered as a father of Christianity and has brought the gospel to the Gentiles. His influence stretches in the four corners of Christianity. There is no place in Christianity that you cannot go where, the where you go where the name of the Apostle Paul is not mentioned. His message, his ethos, his alma mater, we are one. When you think of Billy Graham, can I have some water? <coughs> I'm getting used to this preaching thing, everybody. And I find out that I get really, <coughs> really dry throat. I apologize. God bless you. Proud to be a Jamaican. Thank you. Ah, good old water. Hmm. I'm getting used to this preaching thing, but I'm excited because I'm excited for Jesus because God is good and he's doing wonderful things. I promise I won't keep you too long. <coughs> Here we go. Billy Graham, Billy Graham is said to be one of, if not the most influential evangelists of the 21st century within the Western civilization and arguably the world. His evangelistic series over his lifespan drew a whopping 215 million people in over 185 countries. He provided spiritual guidance to 12 sitting presidents from Harry Truman to Barack Obama. 
and participated in nine presidential inauguration and four swearing ceremonies. He was one of the leading voice in Christian evangelism of his time. His message, his ethos, his alma mater, we are one. And we're not short of men who have tried to unite the world under their banner. We're not short of people who have come up through history who wanted to make the world one, who wanted to unite the world. And we see Jesus in the garden praying for his disciples. And he's praying that they may be one. He is praying for this very thing. But what is oneness? What does it mean to be one? You know, Pastor Natufe warned me about this. He said, Preacher, when are you going to preach? You need to prepare your body to preach. <laughs> I'm sorry, he's watching. I'm sorry, Pastor, I didn't drink enough water. You need to prepare your body to preach. You need to prepare your body to do all these things. When we're children of God, we prepare ourselves to represent God. Whether you're from England, Jamaica, Barbados, or wherever you are in the world, you represent God in your own voice. But Jesus is praying for the church, and he's praying that they will be one. And so we ask the question, what is this oneness? What does it mean to be one? You see, when you think of the word one, you think in singular terms. You think literally one. Now, if you're a Jamaican like me and Elder Fernando, you're familiar with the phrase one dege dege. Anybody here understand that? One dege dege. And dege dege by itself is not so much a word as it is an expression. Did you get that? By itself, dege dege is not so much a word, it's an expression that expresses aloneness, utter singularity, isolation, just one. I remember as a child growing up, we didn't have much. And sometimes all we had to eat was one dumpling and a piece of butter. Anybody can testify this morning. One dumpling and a piece of butter. And I would say to my mom sometimes, I want take a take a dumpling you give me. We can't eat two. One dege dege, singularity, isolation. One, just one. And Jesus is praying for this oneness, this one dege dege ness. Pardon my panjish. I, I don't it's a splangish if you speak it, but what would you say for Jamaican? Uh, Splinglish. I'm happy for her Elder Fernando this morning. And for context, dege dege, as I just said for you, is, a, is an expression to emphasize the one, to emphasize the singularity of the thing. And people have many ideas of what it means to be one. If you ask the Muslim what is oneness, they would say to you, la hila, la hilaha, which means there is no God but Allah. And the Muslim believe that there is only one God, Allah, who is unique, indivincible, and without partners. No Jesus, no spirit, just one God, Allah, by himself. He's alone, just by himself, no community, just him. If you ask the Jews, what is oneness? They would say to you, Shema ye Israel Edonai Elohim Edonai Eka, which means, Here, O Israel, the Lord or God, the Lord is one. They mean that God is seen as the creator and sustainer of the universe, without any partners or equals, just God, no Jesus, just by Himself. And I wasn't satisfied with those answers 
Because while I believe that God is a sustainer and he's by himself in some senses, we see that God is a community. God is one even though God is a community. And we see in the passage that John uses the word one in a unifying, pluralistic, singular voice. He uses the word one in a unifying, pluralistic, singular voice. Where it is not just one, but a group, a nation, multitude, and tongues with a pluralistic agenda bringing about a singular outcome. Coming together as one. We see something similar when we look at Adam. When God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul and God made the woman from the man and when Adam saw Eve, he said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his and shall cleave unto his father and the two shall be one. We see this oneness when the Apostle Paul uses the concept where he said there's one body, one spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, in all and through all. The word one in the passage within the context of the text is expressed as an adjective, nominative, singular, neuter word. Let me say that again. The scripture reading that I just read, where Jesus is asking and praying to his father for the disciples to be one, the apostle John uses the word as an adjective, nominative, singular, neuter word. Pay attention. It is an adjective because it describes a state. What did I just say? It is an adjective, the word one, that they may be one. The oneness that he's praying for is an adjective because it describes a, a state. And for context, I will say, if you look at the word in the Greek, and I don't like to do this so much, but for this, just for this moment, I will do that. If, the Bible was written, the New Testament was written in Greek. Most of us may know this already. But if you didn't, the New Testament was written in Greek. And when you read this passage in the Greek, and you look at the word that John used for the word one, what I'm saying, it is used as an adjective. The word, when you parse it, is an adjective, nominative, singular, neuter word. And follow me closely. It is an adjective because it describes a state. All right? We get that one. This oneness is a state. A state of being. A reality in which the Christian is called to live. Don't miss this. It is singular because it emphasizes the oneness. It is singular because it emphasizes the oneness. And it is in the normative case because the state, watch this, the state is presumed to be a noun. Did you get that? The state is presumed to be a noun. And this is where it gets tricky because the author uses the word as a subject. John uses the word one as a subject. So in the passage, the word is used as a subject. And a subject, as we know, is a part of a sentence that contains the person or thing performing the action. In other words... I won't waste too much time on this. In other words, John wants us to know that this is just not one. This is Jesus. This noun, this subject is Jesus. He is the adhesive and the active agent that creates the state of oneness. Did you get that? He is the active agent that creates the state of oneness. Because within this state of oneness, Jesus Christ himself lives. 
which means that where Jesus is, there is unity. The psalmist said that he exclaimed that at his present, there's fullness of joy. At his right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. The reason why we're not one, if we're not one, is because Jesus does not live in our hearts. If Jesus lives in your heart, you have to be one. Because where Jesus lives, there is unity. There is oneness. There is togetherness regardless of background, age, race. It doesn't matter. Where Jesus lives, there is oneness. I'm coming down. So then the question is answered. This oneness, I pray, Lord, that they will be one as you and I are one. This state, then, is a state of being. This oneness is a reality that the Christian, in which the Christian experienced Jesus. It is a reality, a place that is occupied by Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, we cannot be one. The only way that Christ's way will be one is based on the fact that Jesus occupies and lived in the heart of each member. That's the only way we'll be one. The only way we will be one is if we allow the Spirit of God to break down every barrier, cast out every foe, wash us so that we can be whiter than snow. A house that does not have Jesus at its center cannot be one. A church that does not have Jesus at its center cannot be one. A nation that does not have Jesus at its center cannot be one. And now we see the world is divided, and we see the left, we see the right, we see the up, we see the down, we see the battles that are fighting in the world, and as Christians, we're getting involved and pointing fingers following the world to blame others for the problem. But I want to tell you this morning that Donald Trump is not the problem. President Vladimir Putin is not the problem. President Joe Biden is not the problem. Justin Trudeau, okay, is not the problem. The problem is that people who profess to believe in God do not have Jesus Christ living in their hearts. People who profess to be Christian are acting like the world. There's no difference between the world and the church. So the church cannot be one. The world looks at us and it's laughing. The problem is the church is divided while the devil is at work. The problem is Laodiceanism. We think highly of ourselves that we're rich and in need of nothing and in need of God, but not knowing that we're poor, miserable, naked, and blind. But God calls us to buy of him gold tried in fire so that we may wash our robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus said, if my people who are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their lands and forgive their sins. As we stand at a very important time in history, at a time when there's chaos, when there's wars, and rumors of wars, and nations against nations, and people against people, and tongue against tongue. We come to celebrate every single person in here today. We celebrate you wherever you are, because we believe that God wants the church to be one, regardless of your color, regardless of your background. We are one when we're in Jesus Christ. As I'm closing, the question is how can we be one? How can we be one the way that Jesus describes it, the way that he desires? 
I tell you this morning, church, that when the word of God becomes the meat and bread that transform the power and renew our mind and refresh and transform our lives, then we're one. Did you hear me? When the spirit and the heart of the members of church burns in unity and weep in prayer for souls that are on the path of destruction, we're one. When the citadel of our soul is Jesus Christ and we do not see color, we're one. When I'm not black and you're not white, we're one. When we realize that God in the beginning made them male and female and to say otherwise is to go against God, we're one. When we believe that life begins in the womb and to say otherwise is to go against God, we're one. Cancel me. When we realize the church is a place for young people to freely express themselves, we are one. When Jesus Christ, when in Jesus Christ we live, move, and have our being, we are one. When I'm able to look at you and say we're the same, regardless of background, culture, weakness, strength, and I can pray for you and you pray for me, we're one. When I'm able to sit with you and don't judge you because of how you look or how you act or how you behave, we're one. When you don't gossip behind someone's back about them but go in front of them and tell them how you feel about a situation, we're one. When you put your brother first and he's willing to give him the best of what you have, even if it means that you have to lose it, we are one. We are one when we're united in purpose in Jesus Christ to bring the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. We cannot be one when we are divided. Because when we are divided, we're weak. We're scatters, we're like sheep without shepherds. But when we are united, when I love you the way you love me, when I love you the way I love myself, we are one. The Lord is praying for his church. And he's praying that they, Christ the way, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, the world, wherever the name of Jesus Christ is professed, God is praying that we are one. You know why Jesus hasn't come yet? Because we're not united. We're not united. Because a people that is united is a force to reckon with. A people that is united is powerful. A people that is united will bring nations to its knees. I remember the great Martin Luther King in his time, he was, they were united, so united that they brought America to its knees to recognize that they were also human beings. And they have the right to life and happiness and joy and success. That's what unity does. Unity will bring down empires. And the kingdom of Satan is reigning in the world. Souls are being destroyed. Souls are going into lifeless graves. Young people are leaving the church in great numbers because they too see the church is pretending we are not united. We are not one. But I come to say today, as the praise team comes up, that there is hope. There is hope. There is hope. There is hope in Jesus Christ. There is hope. I stand before you as an example of hope. 
I stand this, this before you this morning as a young man that has been redeemed by God and set in a place where I'm enjoying the blessings of God in abundance. There is hope for oneness. All we have to do this morning is reach out, reach in, and realize that we are one. I'm black, you're white, but we're one. I'm Jamaican, you're Bayesian, but we're one. I'm not rich, you probably are rich, but we're one. Rich in Christ at least. We are one. And as we sing this song, I'm asked to stand to your feet. It says side by side we stand because we know we're one. We know we're united. And I won't make an altar call, but if you want to be one in Jesus Christ, just raise your hands this morning, this afternoon. Praise the Lord. Side by side we stand. If you, if you know it, just sing it. Awaiting God's command. Worshiping. Worshiping the same. in the garden it 
was leaving. He was leaving the earth. And he knew that he wasn't going to be with the disciples anymore. And if you read this spur in John, it's one of the longest spurs that he ever prayed. It's one of the longest spurs that he ever prayed. Because he knows the world is an evil place. And he wants to come back to take us home. But that couldn't happen unless we were one. And he spent the whole night praying this simple prayer. Begging God. Asking God, pleading with his father. That we may be one. Love your brothers. Love your sisters. Love each other. God wants us to love each other. He's not happy when we break each other down. He's not happy when we talk about each other behind our backs. He wants us to love. Because this church, this people, is the only example the world will have of what it means to be one, and what it means to be united. This people, you and me, we are the only example to this dark, chaotic, continuously, perpetually evil world. And so as I pray for you this morning, I encourage you to go home Read John 17, the entire chapter, and see Jesus, see him knelt down in bitter anguish, knowing that he was about to die, but was not praying for himself, was praying for you and me, prayed for us that we would be one. Read the chapter and see Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I'm not ashamed to testify of his goodness, his mercy, and his love. Because I saw what he did for me. He did it for you. He did it for all of us. And when we are one, church, when we are one, the world will notice. The world will notice. The world will look at you, look at me, and say they love each other. That's what Christian means. It means little Jesus. That's the word Christian. It means little Jesus. It means to be completely like Jesus, to love one another. I'm going to pray this morning that God will help us to truly be one. Lord, you've spoken. Your word touched my heart. And we thank you this morning for praying for unity for us. We thank you that though you were heading to the cross, though nails would have been driven through your hands, though you've been whipped and mocked and beaten, sickened to death, you weren't so concerned about 
yourself. You were concerned about everyone in Christ the way this morning. You were concerned about every soul that is called by your name. And you prayed that we would be one. I pray this morning that Christ the way will be one. That every person here today will be one. One in Jesus Christ. United in purpose. We thank you, Lord. And we lift you up. And we glorify, we magnify, and we bless your holy, matchless name. And we thank you for what you have already done here today. And for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say praise the Lord this morning. Amen. Give God the glory and praise that is due to his holy name. For he's worthy. You may be seated now, so the Lord. I just want to say goodbye this morning to our online audience. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. May God continue to richly bless you. This time, we're going to be going for a little break, 15 minutes for tea outside, and then we're going to resume for the lesson study. May God continue to bless you and keep you.